Welcome, FBC Salinas. Wherever you are, whenever you're watching this, let me tell you, we are glad that you are joining us today. And real quick, I have a few announcements for you. And the first one is this. Streets of Bethlehem is happening this week. Please be praying for Streets of Bethlehem and be praying that people come and they come to know Jesus and they encounter him here at this outreach. And another announcement is no Thursday night ministries this week uh, because of Streets of Bethlehem. And the last announcement is prayer. Prayer is incredibly important. And if you are in need of prayer, please email prayer at fbcsalinas.com. And there'll be a whole team of people praying for you. And at this time, I would like to invite my beautiful wife, Emily, and uh, my son, Levi, up here. Because today, believe it or not, is actually the first week of Advent. It is already here. And uh, today, we are going to be lighting the candle of hope and it is easy to get caught up in this season and the traditions that come with this season. It's easy to get caught up and concerned with, you know, what family am I going to go see today? Do I have the right presence? It's easy to get caught up in this season and forget the reason for this season. And, and Paul in Romans chapter 15, verses 12 and 13, he reminds us what this season is all about. In verse 12 of Romans chapter 15, he says, and again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That root of Jesse did come. And it didn't, he didn't come as a, a king in a castle. He came as a baby in a manger. And, and because of that root of Jesse, because of Jesus coming into the world, we have hope. This is the, the season of hope. But our hope is not seasonal. Our hope is every single day of the year because Jesus has come. And let us be reminded of that as we light the candle of hope. And let us pray. Father, we thank you for, for the hope that you bring. Lord, I pray we are reminded of this. I pray we don't think about you coming into the world during Christmas time. Lord, I pray we think about it every single day. That you came. You came born in a manger. Lord, I thank you for the hope that you give us. And I pray we don't get caught up with this season and what this season brings. Lord, I pray we get caught up with what this season means. Lord, I thank you for all that you do. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And let's come together and, and lift our voices and sing to a God who is so amazing, the God of hope. And we sing to him because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Lift high the name of Jesus. 
such mean estate where ox and ass are feeding could Christian feed for sinners here the silent word is pleading nails spear shall pierce him through the cross be born for me for you hail hail the word made flesh the babe the son of Mary so and king to own him the king of kings salvation brings let loving hearts enthrone him raise raise the song on high the virgin sings her lullaby. Joy, joy, for Christ is born, the babe, the son of we come to the portion of our service where we have our guided prayer. And what is going to happen is we're going to go through some topics and we're going to pray through them together. And I, I really encourage you to just take this time, carve it out, and pray as you feel led. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again for this day. Lord, I thank you for the ability to worship you and, and proclaim that you are Lord and, and be able to celebrate this season of Advent. And Lord, today I, I pray for, for us, for everyone who's watching, for FBC Salinas, this community of Christ followers. Lord, I pray that gratitude and generosity would be our lifestyle. Lord, I pray that we don't miss an opportunity to show someone your love. Lord, I pray that we, we walk the walk, we don't just talk the talk. Lord, I pray that we show people who you are by the way we live our lives. And Lord, I want to thank you, and I want to lift up all of the hospital workers, uh, those who are putting in these hours, and, and all the first responders. Lord, I, I pray you continue to look after them. You continue to guide them. Lord, I pray you keep your hands wrapped around them as they continue uh, to do their jobs in this, in this climate, in this time. I thank you for them. And Lord, I want to lift up all of the missionaries and, and the ministries that, that we support. But today I want to lift up Confidence Pregnancy Center. Lord, I pray you guide them as they help young women who are going through a season in their life. Lord, I pray uh, you give them the right tools that are necessary to do their job and continue to promote life. Lord, I want to pray for all the churches across Salinas who are meeting right now. And uh, Lord, I, I want to lift up Harvest Lands Church, pastored by John McFall. Lord, I pray as they come together and they worship you, that, that their mind is just fixated and focused on you, that your truth is proclaimed, 
that they worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord, and every move that they make and every step that they take goes to glorifying you. And Lord, I want to lift up and just put it in your hands, uh, Streets of Bethlehem. Uh, this, this outreach that we do, it's been going on for a long time. Lord, I pray that all the volunteers, that you give them endurance. And I pray that they keep a servant's heart. And we do this to the best of our abilities. And Lord, I pray for everyone who comes through uh, those gates. I pray that they encounter you. And that, Lord, I pray that this is, is an opportunity for, for them to hear about you, hear about what this season is all about. And that hope has come into the world. And Lord, I, I pray they just encounter you from the, from the actors to the, the prayer team to, to everyone who comes through and who puts this together. Lord, I pray that they do it to their best, the best of their abilities. Lord, I thank you for all that you do for us. Just each and every day, we are, we are so blessed. And we thank you that you are good. And Lord, I pray today as we worship you that, that you are glorified every step of the way. I thank you for all that you do each and every day. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And uh, there are many ways to support the ministry of FBC. Uh, one of them is by giving tithes and offerings. And you can give your tithes and offerings by going to fbcsalinas.com and clicking that yellow donate button. Uh, you could also come by the church. We would love to see you. But however you do support the ministry of FBC, we want to thank you for your continued generosity. Today's the first Sunday of Advent, and we're talking about hope, and as we move through this season of Advent, I want you to know this, that God is good. He's good all the time, and we, we rejoice in that, and as we continue moving through this year, we look back and we see all that God has done in the midst of this year, and what a year it's been. And we began this year with this theme of hope lives. That's been the theme throughout FBC Salinas this year as, as we've talked about what our vision is for this year and hope lives. And we come to this time now where, where people perhaps were wondering, where is the hope? Where is the hope? And it's still there. Because God is still there, because God is still moving. And, and oftentimes we, we go through life and we're, we're planning one thing, but something else happens. And that's predominantly what happens here in the, in the Christmas story, in the Advent story found in, in Luke chapter 1. And what ends up happening is, is there's this surprise. And I want to talk to you real quickly about a surprise that happened to me a number of years ago. My birthday falls very close to Christmas, and so my wife, because she's, she does this every now and then, she threw me a surprise birthday party in the middle of the summer. And it so caught me off guard, and I need to give you the details because of what happened to make this surprise all the more amazing. And our life group that we were in, this is back in Scottsdale, so it's about 15, 16 years ago, we're in this life group, and and so the life group and Dawn coordinated this surprise party for me in the middle of the summer to celebrate my birthday. And they worked in such unison that they even roped me into the surprise without realizing that I was being roped in. And our youth intern at that time, a guy by the name of Mitch Melzer, was, was uh, the, the son of one of the people, one of the couples in our life group. And, and they, his birthday is in late July. And so they played it up as if I was going to be helping a surprise birthday party for Mitch. And what I needed to do was this, was that, and if I was willing to do this, I needed to go play a round of golf with Mitch in the late afternoon uh, in late July. Now, I want you to think about this. Yes, I love golf. I will play it anytime, anywhere, any place. I, I love it. But playing golf in late afternoon in late July in Scottsdale, Arizona is comparable to playing golf on the surface of the sun. 
but I went for it. And Mitch, you need to know, is not a good golfer. And when I mean he's not a good golfer, he is the only person I have played golf with that successfully hit the same house two different times on two different occasions when we were playing together, and he's, he's just not good. That's all there is to it. And so, so I have to convince him to play golf with me. Well, Mitch is involved in the surprise, and so Mitch plays it up that it's going to be a very big inconvenience for him. So I need to convince him that he needs to do this. And I said, Mitch, the deal is you need to go play golf with me because we need to talk about some issues with the student ministry. And so we go out, we play golf, and I'm all excited because Mitch is playing and not playing that well, but we keep playing. And Mitch the whole time is reminding me of how miserable he is out there because he's part of the surprise. So Don said to me, she said, you need to get to the church around 6 o'clock. And so, so we show up at the church, and there are no cars in the parking lot. And, and Mitch says, why are we here at the church? I said, I said, well, I need you to help me move a box from in, in Fellowship Hall. And Mitch looks at me and says, this is the whole reason? This is the whole reason why you didn't take me home? You brought me to the church so you could just use my, 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 my strength to help you move this box? I said, yes, Mitch, that's exactly right. And so Mitch, we get out of the car, and Mitch is, Mitch is not happy. And then I'm smiling, and he says, what are you smiling about? I said, I said you're going to love what's in this box. And so we open the doors to Fellowship Hall. And the next thing I know, as I open the door, I say, surprise. Mitch looks at me and says, surprise. And about 100 people in the room are yelling, surprise. And I'm thinking, they're all here for Mitch. And Heidi and Stephanie are younger at this time, and they're holding up signs that say this, surprise, Dad, this party's for you. I look at the signs, I look at Mitch, and I said, dude, this is your surprise party. And Mitch says to me, read the signs. So I read the signs again, and they say, surprise, Dad, this party's for you. And it hit me that I had been surprised, not only surprised, I had been played perfectly by Mitch, my wife, my family, and our life group. And people were yelling and laughing, and I was speechless, if you can believe that. That's how much of a surprise it was. I had no words to say. And we come to this event that happened about 2,000 years ago, and Mary is surprised. Oh, she is surprised, and she is speechless. She's surprised by hope. And when we are surprised by hope, everything changes from there on out. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, and we look at verse 26 all the way down to 38. And listen to what, the, what Luke writes here. He says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will, be, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Father, we pray now as we come to this time of looking at your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will open our eyes, that we can see the beautiful 
story of hope. That you will open our ears that we can hear that reminder of hope in the midst of all that's going on in our world today. That you would open our minds that we can understand that hope simply isn't a word, but it is a lifestyle. It is a choice. It, is, it changes everything. And that you would transform our hearts in such a way that we would be people of hope, no matter what comes our way. Lord, thank you for surprising us. Thank you for doing what you do all the time in our lives. And we pray now that you would continue to be lifted up, that you would be glorified. And that no one would hear anything I say, but only what it is that you want them to hear and need them to hear. And may you be the one we, we focus on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Surprise. Guess who? That seems to be what's going on here in verses 26 through 28. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. It's almost as if God is saying, surprise, I'm doing something now. And we need to remember this, that from the last verse of the Old Testament until this opening chapter of Luke's gospel, more than a few years have passed. It's been 400 years. 400 years since God really, that, that we have any type of, of encounter between God and, and humanity as far as, as far as being recorded. We don't have a whole lot. It isn't that God took the time off. It's that we don't have much recorded. God was still doing things, but yet people were anticipating something big. And over the course of that 400-year period of time, from the end of Malachi to this opening chapter, the world has changed. The Babylonians are no longer in power. It's the Romans. The Romans are in power, and they are expanding their power Day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, their kingdom continues to expand. They are on a serious crusade. They are on a serious role to have world dominion. And God had foretold earlier in the Old Testament about the fact that he was going to come, that there was going to be this long-awaited Messiah, that, that the Messiah was going to come on the scene and make everything right. And for 400 years, God's people were wondering and wondering and wondering, has he forgotten us? Has he forgotten us? And Luke goes to this encounter between the angel and Mary. And it's almost, not almost, it is God saying, I haven't forgotten you. I'm here. And I am about to do something that will surprise everyone. No one, no one will understand fully what's about to happen. And when angels make an appearance in the Bible, it's always a surprise. It's not like somebody woke up that morning and said, you know what, I hope to have an encounter with an angel at 1.30 this afternoon, so I need to schedule that in. Angels simply show up. And when angels show up, it's because there's something massive about, about to happen and God's about to do something. We have this encounter between Hag Hagar in the desert with her son Ishmael. God speaks into that. We have Gideon who's on the threshing floor and the Midianites are overwhelming them. And, and in the midst of this crisis, God speaks there. We have Moses in the burning bush. We have Elijah as he's fleeing Jezebel. He encounters this angel. Because angels show up when God is about to do something big. But again, I remind you, nobody, nobody schedules in an angelic experience or an angelic appearance, I should say. Nobody pencils that in. It's a surprise. And it's a surprise to Mary here as well. But before we get to Mary's response, notice what the angel says to her because Luke is writing to people who are being oppressed by the Romans. And the Romans are I'll just tell you, they're the baddest, biggest group on the planet at this particular time. And what they wanted to do, they did. But I want you to notice this. In the surprise, there's another surprise. 
And what is that big surprise you would imagine or you're asking? Look closely at what, what, the, what the greeting is from the angel here in verse 28. The angel went to her and said, greetings you who are highly favored. The Romans are in control. The Roman way is the only way. And for the Romans, might makes right. And if you fall out of favor with the Romans, you're in trouble. But notice what Luke does here. And I think we have to keep the context of the Christmas story before us all the time. The context is this, is that the Roman Empire was brutal. It was ruthless. And they told you whether or not you were highly favored. They told you how you were supposed to look at yourself and the way you viewed it yourself. They told you when you could do this and when you could do that. And Luke speaks into this, and it is a direct assault on the way the Romans are dealing with people. Mary is highly favored. Not according to the Romans, she's not. But she's highly favored. God says she's highly favored. What does that mean? It means this, that the Romans may very well think of Mary as this 12 or 13-year-old girl and let that sink in. She's maybe 12, many commentators, and most people are in agreement with this, that Mary was probably 12 to 14 years of age when this happens to her. First off, women in the Roman government were treated like property. Secondly, now you add in her age and children in Roman times weren't well valued. And of course, yes, she's a little bit older than a child at this point, but yet she's a, she's a female and she's young. She has no worth in the, in, in the Romans' perspective. And God comes in, the angel comes in and says to her, you are highly favored. Let that sink in. What Luke is saying here to all those who are reading is this, is that yes, the Romans are in power and yes, they may very well have you convinced that you have to do certain things a certain way to receive power from them, but God on high says you are highly favored. You are highly favored. Yes, Mary, you might not be much at all in, in the Roman Empire's lives and in, in, the, in their perspective, but you know what? God highly favors you. God cares about you. And then he follows it up and he says this, the Lord is with you. In Roman times, if you were not with the Romans, you know what? You were dead, wiped out. They had that type of strength. They said, we're going to do things the way we want to do them. And if you don't like it, fine, we'll just get rid of you. And so he's, he says, the angel says, you are highly favored. And he follows it up immediately by saying, the Lord is with you. She has great value. She, can, she has the strength to go through this because God is with her. The Romans treated people as if they didn't matter. If, they weren't, if you weren't with them, they were against you, and you didn't matter at all. You weren't that essential. And yes, I said that word for a reason. At the beginning of our COVID experience, remember when we had to go into, into this, this lockdown type experience, and people were told that if you don't have an essential job, Stay home. I said it then, and I will continue saying it now. When that happened, it left a mark on everybody. Because all of a sudden, if you have a job that's deemed unessential, you're sitting at home, you're wondering, Do, is what I'm doing not matter at all? The, what do, how do I operate? How do I, what do I do? And you've heard this, and, and if you haven't, you can, do the, you can do the research. But research are saying over and over again that the amount of depression, the amount of, the amount of isolation, the belief that people are no longer essential 
is skyrocketing. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that God sees everyone as essential. God sees this 12 to 14 year old young girl by the name of Mary. He sees her as essential. Oh, the Romans overlooked her. Oh, the, oh, the Romans may have undervalued her. Not may have. They did undervalue her. And, 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 and in the midst of that, God says, I am with you. Perhaps you're one of the people that, that works in a quote-unquote non-essential job. And perhaps you're thinking right now, you don't have much worth. Read the Bible and you will find this out, that God over and over and over again says, I am with the overlooked and undervalued, and I am capable to walk you through all of this. Everybody is created in the image of God, therefore everybody has essential value in God's eyes. You see, the surprise is that God wants to work in all of our lives. And the overlooked and the undervalued that we simply say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. God says, oh, oh, they're a very big deal to me. And then the surprise continues. And listen to these words. We are at verse 29. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdoms will never end. Surprise, Mary, I have some really big news for you. Wow, Mary has this encounter with this angel and we read these words that she was greatly troubled at his words. And, and by the way, who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be troubled by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be? And she gives us the proper response to, to any type of angel. And it's this, complete shock. She doesn't know what to do. Mary is absolutely shocked, and her response is no different than anyone else's. Wow. She wonders what type of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. It's interesting that the angel reminds her of something that he just said to her a few moments prior. He says, you have found favor with God. And I think so often we sit there and think that we, perhaps we found favor, not perhaps, but we found favor with God and we're going, that can't be right. And we have to be reminded of this. Because we're created in his image, we have great value to him. And so often we forget that. Mary is, is, is really in the Roman Empire, she's a nobody, but in God's eyes, she's a somebody. She works, she, she, she works to do what God wants her to do. And so often we forget that he cares for us, that he's right there with us. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Interesting, isn't it? She is a young virgin, and now she's told she's going to conceive and give birth to a son. That's wild enough. But then throw on top of this, by the way, Mary, we've already named your son. God's already named your son. And throughout Scripture, there's great significance when God names someone. Throughout Scripture, he names different individuals. God names Ishmael in Genesis chapter 16 as a reminder that God hears the cries of his people. In the book of Hosea, every single one of the prophet's children has a name that God gives that child. And it's to remind them, A, of who God is, and B, of how, how God's people have responded to them. Earlier in Luke chapter 1, we read about John the Baptist being, 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 uh, being brought into this world. And Zechariah is told, you will name him John. Zechariah and Elizabeth don't name him. God does. 
And here we have this experience where all of a sudden Mary's told this in the midst of all that's going on, in the midst of her shock, and she's told this, you will name him Jesus. What does Jesus mean? It means God is Savior. Mary, you're going to give birth to God is Savior. Every time you call him in for dinner, every time you call him to come in from outside when he's growing up, you're calling his name Jesus, and it is a reminder to you that God is Savior. I want you to never forget this. And not only do I not want you to ever forget this, I don't want anybody to ever forget this, that his name is Jesus and that God truly saves. And then he continues on as if that's not enough. Look at verse 32. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. All of a sudden it's ding, ding, ding time. Oh, God has now on, now he's coming. This Messiah that we've heard about for all these years and for 400 years have been silent, all of a sudden, he is the one who will be called the Son of the Most High. He is the long-awaited Messiah. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Let that sink in. You sit there and say, wait a second, David's not his dad. You're right, not. But he's from that line. And that line is points back to David. And God made a promise to David a long time ago that he will have a king that will reign forever and ever. Amen. There's that fulfillment there. And not only will he have the throne, notice what it says next. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. It's quite a throne, and it is quite a reign. It's quite a throne that he is going to be the one who is exalted above all other kings that Israel ever had. And it's quite a reign because his reign continues on and on and on, and he continues reigning to this very day. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He will not ever stop being that. His kingdom will never end. We read these words from our 21st century perspective and we're saying, wow, this is awesome. And I realize what I'm going to ask you to do is it's impossible to do. But you're a 12 to 14-year-old girl in the Roman Empire. You've just received these words These words are powerful words. These words go directly against the Roman Empire because we've been told that the Caesars are the ones who are in control. They are the ones who dictate a kingdom. They are the ones who reign and rule. And now you're telling me that I'm going to give birth to the son of the most high, that he will sit on the throne of his father David, that his kingdom will never end. Wow. Would you be excited or would you be fearful? What were you like when you were 12, 13, 14 years of age and were given a big assignment? The biggest assignment I can think of when I was that age may have been a five-page essay in my English class. She's given the assignment of... (laughs) Carrying the Messiah and giving him birth in this world. Excited or fearful? Verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? That's a response. How's this going to happen? And we can read that as, oh, how is this going to happen? Or we can read that as, how is this going to happen? I don't know. And here's the last part of the surprise. Hope is real. 
The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her, in her old age and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month for no word from God will ever fail. There's hope. There's hope. Mary asked this question. She asked this question, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And by the way, we're given a few details prior that she's pledged to be married to this guy by the name of Joseph. She's now told that she's going to become pregnant. Now, here's the, here, here are just a couple things. She says, how's this going to happen? And perhaps why she's asking that question is this, what about her reputation? When word gets out that I'm pregnant, and oh, by the way, what about the impact that this will have on my fiance, for lack of a better word, Joseph? What's going to happen here? What's going to happen? Because if it's proven, and we're told this, she could, if it's proven that, that, well, it's not just proven, but what we're told in Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, Joseph is tempted to divorce her when he finds out this information. Once she's divorced, her life is pretty much over at that point. But in the midst of it, notice the, notice the response from the angel. When we think that hope is gone, when we think that hope isn't going to happen, hope is is always real. Notice what the angel says here. The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. Here's the deal, Mary. Yes, I understand that you're concerned, but I want you to know this. God is already moving in your midst. Your, your relative Elizabeth is pregnant with child. God is on the move. In the midst of our thinking that there is no hope, in the midst of our thinking that what are we going to do now or, or how are we going to navigate this, in the midst of all that's happened in 2020 when hope seems to be some fleeting concept now, God speaks into this and says, I am still moving and I'm not done. I'm not done and I'll never be done because my kingdom reigns forever and ever. And then he says this in verse 37, for no word from God will ever fail. No word from God will ever fail. I want to encourage you to write this down. It's a question with an answer. And here we go. What is it that God can't do? That's the question. Here's the answer. Fail. He can't do it. It's impossible for God to fail. He's been undefeated throughout eternity. He will be undefeated throughout all of eternity. And for us to think, well, God's going to fail on me now. Are you kidding me? He's undefeated. What makes you or I think that he's not going to come through? What makes you or I think that the hope that he offers is no longer going to be valid in our lives? He's undefeated. No word from God will ever fail. Oh, we'll fail him. We'll disappoint him. Don't, don't, don't fool yourself on this. But he will never fail. He never will. Mary needed that reminder. She asked the question, how will this be? I don't see how this is going to work out. The angel speaks into her life and says, God's already moving here and God's already doing this. And by the way, Mary, in case you forgot, God never fails. Her response, verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. I want to stop there. I want to encourage you to read through these verses on, on, at, at your own time. Read through verses 26 to 38, and you'll notice this. There's not one mention of Mary's family in this entire thing. Why do I bring this up? Because Mary's very first response after she accepts the fact that this is great news 
her very first response is this, I'm the Lord's servant. A servant back in, back in Roman times was only as great as the family in which they were serving or who they were serving. If you were a servant in, in some government and high in some high ranking official's place, you're you being a servant is like, oh, you you work for so and so. Being a servant was all about who you were serving. And notice what Mary says here. I'm the Lord's servant. You don't know anything about my family, but I am part of God's family. Not just any family, but God's family. And when I'm serving in God's family, I know who my father is, and I know he's going to take care of me. You see, Mary responds by saying, I'll serve in that family. I'll serve any time, no matter what comes my way. Mary was surprised 2,000 years ago. I was surprised by this surprise party that happened to me about 16 years ago or so, and it caught me off guard, and I was speechless. My prayer for us this upcoming year and this upcoming season that we're about to experience is that we will pray that God will use us to be a surprise of hope to people who are hopeless. And they're everywhere. What is 750,000 miles long? So long that it could wrap itself around the earth 30 times and it grows an additional 20 miles longer with each and every day. It's the line of people on earth who have no hope because they don't know Jesus. We can surprise them with hope. Not in us, but we can surprise them with the hope of Jesus Christ. A hope that says you matter. A hope that says I'm with you. A hope that says, my kingdom, my reign never ends. A hope that says, you feel as if you're not part of anyone's family. I'm here to give you a hope and say, you can be part of my family. The greatest family history has ever seen. We can surprise people with hope because they desperately need it. May we give that hope to all we encounter in life to every person we meet, may they experience the hope that is found in Jesus Christ because we are people who have been surprised by hope and he never fails. Father, we pray now, as we consider these words, we would ask that your Holy Spirit will continue to move in our midst. I thank you for Mary's response and saying, I'm gonna serve be serving in the greatest family of all time. May we serve as well. May we serve with a passion, with a desire to know you better and to help others experience the hope that is found in you. So Lord, use each and every one of us. Break through our doubts, break through our questions, break through our confusions and remind us that we can be surprised by hope. Because the hope you offer is a never-ending hope. A hope you offer is, is unconditional. And a hope you offer lasts forever. May we rejoice in that. And may we be instruments of throwing surprise parties of hope in this season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite Jamal and... Adam to come back up as we sing one more song. And as we sing this song, it's my prayer that each and every one of us will be surprised by hope. Perhaps right now you're wondering, do I have any hope? Perhaps right now you're wondering, where is God in the midst of all this? 
Know this, that we're here to help in whatever way we can. And know this as we sing this song, it's my prayer that the words of this song will sink in and remind us of how great this God is, this God of hope who never fails, this God of hope who carries us through whatever comes our way. is the Lord, the Lord Most High, great are you, Lord, mighty in strength, you are faithful and you will ever be, we will praise you. For your glory, we offer everything. Raise your hands, all your nations, to God, all creation. How awesome is the Lord Most High. Where you send us, God, we will go. You're the answer. Shout to God, all creation, how awesome is the Lord Most High. We will praise you together, for now and forever, how awesome is the Lord Most High. Hallelujah. is the Lord most high. Hallelujah, hallelujah, how awesome is the Lord most high. Raise your hands, raise your hands, all you nations, shout to God, all creation, how awesome is the Lord most high. together for now and forever how awesome is the Lord most high raise your hands all your nation shout to God all creation how awesome is the Lord most high we will praise you together for now Lord Most High, Lord Most High, that's true, the Lord Most High. May you enjoy these days, and may you be surprised by the hope that he gives. And if you have questions about that, please reach out to us with an email, a phone call, drop by the church. We'd be more than happy to interact with you about this and answer your questions or concerns and pray with you. I love you. I miss you. I hope you're doing well. God bless you. Enjoy the day. Bye-bye.